probably. I guess I'm good. Uh, all right. So we're going to start chapter four, and uh, this is uh, we're going to start talking about something called congruences. Some of you uh, use this notation on on some of your homework, and um, unfortunately, I had to stick to my guns and say that uh, you 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 know you need to just use what we've talked about in class. Otherwise, it puts other students kind of at an unfair advantage. Um, but now you can use this because we're going to talk about it today. Okay, so. Some of you have seen this before, you know, n's congruent to 3 mod 5, this kind of stuff. Um, we're going to just define all of this and kind of go through the basics today. I think you'll find, I think you, you'll find this to be maybe a little more intuitive given what we've already done. Um, I, I think you might find that the homework questions are a little more, um, well, maybe, maybe not, but you might find that they're a little bit easier than some of the ones that we've done so far. So. Um, I definitely think they're a little more interesting, at least. So you can really kind of do some, some neat stuff with, with this, this concept. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. OK. I'm just going to call this, this is not, it's called basic properties of congruence, but I, I don't want to write all that out. But. Uh, yeah, but then no one would know what that was if I just abbreviated it without saying. Um, okay, so this idea of congruence is, is actually very simple. It's not, it's not complicated at all. Really, it isn't. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go straight into the definition of what a congruence is. And then we'll just do a couple of easy examples. You will all understand, I mean, at least just in the, at the kind of basic level, all of you will understand this. There's, there's no question about it. Okay, so I just want to emphasize a couple of things here. Let n be a positive integer. Okay, so I want to underline this. Um, of course, this is uh, just another way of saying natural number, right? Okay, so two integers A and B are congruent modulo N. Here's how you denote this. Okay, I'm going to make a, just a little bit of a fuss here. Okay, hopefully I won't screw this up. That was, okay, that wasn't really very good, but uh, at least, well, at least you can see that there are three lo uh, lines here, right? So you're stiff over that? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, I am a little bit. Um, Okay, now, am I going to get really upset if you use equals? No, no, I'm not, a little bit, but not that upset. <laughs> um, but really, this convention is to use these bars. This is, this is something, and the, here's, here's the reason why, well, one of the reasons why I really want you to use this, is uh, some of you are going to go on to take abstract algebra and maybe take some other higher courses. Um, this is a sort of standard symbol that denotes something which I won't talk about now, but it's just good to get in the habit of using it now, okay? Because then it, later on, it's really going to be even worse if you use equals. So I would rather you just do it now. Okay, <clears throat> and then the definition is just, it's very simple, provided n divides a minus b. That's it. Um, because, I mean, it's obviously not equal, and I get that, right. but why can't The, this term really comes from, uh, abstract algebra, which I know you've already taken. Yeah. Um, it's something called a congruence relation, which I probably won't say anything about right now. 
<laughs> but I mean, that's a good question, and there is a good reason for it. But it, really, the answer is in abstract algebra, and most people aren't going to know what I'm talking about. But I can certainly, before after class, I can tell you okay. if you want. Um, okay, so that's that's the definition, and we're just going to do a couple examples just to make sure that you kind of have an idea of, of what this is saying. So example one, and I what I really would encourage you to do is just think about the definition. If you haven't seen this before, think about it for a second. Uh, I'm going to do three examples here for those of you that haven't seen it, but it's not that hard. So the point is, this is the way that you want to think about it. I mean, it's kind of weird new notation, but you just think, okay, whatever this is, the mod part, it just, it just divides the difference, A minus B, left minus right. That's, that's all you have to think about, okay? So in this case, of course, the A in this problem is 7, and the B, or in this example is 7, the B is 2, right? And so being congruent just means that 5, in this case, right? 5 is the end, divides A minus B, divides 7 minus 2, which is, of course, true. 5 divides 5. So that's all, that's all you're asking yourself. Take the left-hand guy, subtract the right-hand guy, and ask yourself if the number next to the mod divides it. That's it. That's it. Okay. So I don't think that this is even going to show up in your book, but I'm just to be on the safe side, I'm going to say it. Okay. Is there anything, do we have any issues with this? It's not positive. So this is undefined. This is undefined. Okay. Okay, sorry. 12, so example one was 7 is congruent to 2 mod 5. Example 2, 12 congruent to 2 mod minus 10, which is undefined because the modulus part is negative, not positive. Okay. Of course, you might say, well, why, why we could define it, just define it the same way. Does minus 10 divide 12 minus 2? Yes, it does. It's just that um, more or less there's just no reason to define it for negative integers, which I may see more about later. But the point is that this just doesn't really have any meaning. Okay. Now, I, I do want to make this clear, though. Notice that A and B are integers. I didn't make, make any more additional restrictions on A and B, right? I never said they were positive. So the congruence, the only number, the only integer that actually has to be positive is the one next to mod on the right. That's the only one that actually has to be positive. Otherwise, everything's fine. So it's the same question. Does 7 divide minus 31 minus 11? Think about this. Minus 31 minus 11 is minus 42. 7 times minus 6 is minus 42, so it does, right? So I'll just put this in parentheses. 7 divides minus 31 minus 11. Okay? Right? 7 times minus 6 is equal to that. Okay, so... For those of you that haven't seen this before, really you just have to kind of get in your mind just what it is. When you see a when you see this mod notation with this congruence symbol, these three bars, you just need to translate that into a, something that um, you sort of just translate this into a, an assertion about divisibility, which we've been talking about now for quite a while. So basically what we can do is um, this is going to end up being sort of a shorthand. It's going to kind of give us a shortcut for solving problems where before we might use the division algorithm, now we can, we can really save a lot of time. Um, so this is kind of, this isn't a really great example, but in, in some sense this is sort of like what you did with derivatives when you learned the derivative computing it by the, the limit definition, right, and you had to write everything out. Now we can kind of get a shortcut and we can actually solve these problems a lot more quickly. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, is there a reason why they didn't reduce 11 down other than to show it? Because you could have just taken another 11 out of, or another 7 out of that? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, we're going we're gonna to get to that. Um, here in a little bit, but yeah, I, I know, I know, I know what you're what you're thinking, and, and yeah, um, 
So you can write 11. 11 is the same thing as 4 mod 7. Right. So, but yeah, we're, we'll, we'll, talk okay. about, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what is this really saying? Um, let's see. Let me uh, go. Oops. Okay. I did this again. All right. Sorry. Purple. Okay. Where do I where, where I'm purple? Oops, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Let me... Everybody's got this down. I've been blabbing now for a few minutes, right? Okay. All right. I'd like to just get this at the top anyways. So, here's... The first theorem. This theorem is not very, very complicated. Um, this kind of just lets you know what direction we're going. So you might say, well, okay, great. Why did you define this? Who cares? What's the point here? Um, so here's the point. Um, we're going to let n be a natural number. Instead of saying positive integer, I'm just going to write it this way. So you should, all, you should all remember what capital N is, right? The positive integers. Um, sorry, make this a comma. And let... A and B be integers, then A is congruent to B modulo N or mod N. Um, if and only if A and B have the same remainder upon division by N. And you're going to see that this really just reduces down to things that we've already done. Um, there's a longer theorem I'm going to give you, which I'm not going to do all of. I probably won't prove every part of it, but I'm going to do some of these proofs. Well, of course, I normally do that, but um, some of the homework problems, you're going to have to kind of get these, these techniques down, these kind of ideas down. So um, you'll see, I think you'll see if you, if you follow along here that this is not really that bad. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to let n, a, and b um, just be as stated in the theorem. Okay, so let's suppose this is an if and only if statement, right? So we're going to suppose first that um, A is congruent to B modulo N. Okay. So we want to show that A and B have the same remainder when we divide by N. Well, this kind of implicitly invokes the division algorithm, excuse me, the division algorithm, right? So we know we can divide by n, we get a remainder that's between 0 and n, right? We've proved this already. Um, so I'll just, uh, just say it this way, by the division algorithm, A equals NQ plus R, right? We're dividing by N, Q is the quotient, R is the remainder. For some integer Q and some integer R with, most of you were pretty good with this on the exam, with um, 0 less than or equal to R less than n. 
right? That's what the division algorithm says. OK, so what we're trying to get to is that B has, has uh, OK, let me say it this way first. R is the remainder upon division of A by N, right? R is the remainder. So we want to show that the same R is also the remainder for B when we divide by N. So somehow we're going to want to use this fact. And so what you want to do, this is just to give you kind of a tip here how you would proceed with the proof, is say, OK, well, we want R to be the remainder when we divide B by N. We've got this piece of information that we're assuming, so let's use this somehow. So the, the best thing to do is just go back to the definition, go back to what it means. It means that N divides A minus B. And using that, hopefully we'll be able to get to what we, what we want, right? Um, since A is congruent to B mod N, Uh, I'll just remind you what this means. N divides A minus B. Okay, right, that's just the definition. So, NX equals A minus B for some integer X, right? Okay. <clears throat> Here, why don't... Uh, just to make this a little bit clearer, I should have done this before, I apologize. Let me put an asterisk next to this equation up here, that A is NQ plus R. So, by this, by star we have NX equals A minus B, right? That's just coming right from here. And then we can replace the A with NQ plus R. You see that? OK, so everybody see what I did? Right. A is NQ plus R, so I'm just replacing it right here. And from this, um, OK, let me, let me kind of go some, slowly through this. So what we have then is, if we just jump to the, from the first term to the last part of the equation, we have nx equals nq plus r minus b, right? nx is equal to this. So what I'm going to do, okay, so now I want to say where we're going with this, we want r to be the remainder when we divide b by n. So what I'm going to do is just solve this equation for b. And you're going to see that we have two n terms. So I'll be able to get b equals n times something plus r. So it has the same remainder. r is the remainder in this case as well. OK, b equals nq minus nx plus r. All I'm doing is shuffling the algebra here, right? I'm just bringing the b over here, subtracting the nx, and bringing that over here. Nothing too complicated. Sorry, I didn't mean to put the period in. So this is equal to n times q minus x. We factor out the n, and then plus r. OK. So now I know that r is the remainder upon division by n. All right, now there's a uniqueness part of the division algorithm that said there are unique integers q and r that satisfy, you know, n equals, um, or sorry, b equals nq plus r, where r satisfies 0 less than or equal to r less than n. Okay, it's unique. So because we know that b is equal to n times something plus something that's strictly between, z sorry, it's between 0 and strictly less than n, we know that R has to be the remainder because it's unique. That was part of the division algorithm is that these things are unique. So we automatically get for free that R is the remainder. Okay, 
Um, what I'm going to do for the sake of time is I'm going to omit the other direction. This is an if and only if proof, so technically we need to prove that if A and B have the same remainder, then A is congruent to B mod N. That's, we've only done half of it, but I'm just, I'm not going to do that because we've got a lot to do today. Um, so, it's in the book also. Um, page 64 in the book, yeah. Uh, actually, I can just kind of tell you what it is really quickly because it's really easy. Suppose, just, just say that A and B both have a remainder 5 when you divide by N. Well, then what form does A have? A has the form um, NQ plus 5 and B has the form NQ prime plus 5. So when you sh subtract, the, the remainder is going to cancel and N is going to divide it. Okay, I mean, it's, there's really nothing to it. Um, so <clears throat> this was the part that required a little more work. All right, so we have this down. Yeah, am I good? Okay. All right. So this this is important. Also, we're, we're going to use this later. The book goes into something that they call a complete set of residues modulo n, and it's. Uh, I'm going to avoid using that terminology just just because I don't want. I don't want you to get confused with this kind of weird lingo. What I'm giving you is the corollary is essentially when they're saying complete set of residues, this is what it, what it means. Okay. I'm not going to use that terminology in, in this class. <clears throat> okay. N's a natural number, A is an integer. Okay, so I'm writing out a little bit more than I normally would, but I think this will make it a little bit clearer. Hopefully this is clear. I didn't have room to, to keep doing this, but what I mean is, of course, the pattern continues. So A is congruent to 0 mod n, A is congruent to 1 mod n, A is congruent to 2 mod n, A is congruent to 3 mod n, all the way down to n minus 1 mod n. Exactly one of these holds. Okay? Uh, in, the, in the book, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, well, it sort of, it basically is, except they, they don't use, they use this complete re set of residues. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's in here somewhere. Um, no, it's okay. It's, let me see. Um, no, you know what, what it looks like is that the book just sort of mentions this and they kind of give a, a proof, but they don't actually list it as a certain theorem or, or a, a corollary. They just kind of mention it on page 64. So I'm going to, I want to outline this specifically as a, as a corollary because I think it's important. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Well, um, again, we're just going to let N and A be as stated. And I'll tell you before I, I go into this, really what this is, kind of what this is saying. Uh, really, this is, this is the content of this corollary, even though it, it's in this kind of funky notation. All it's saying really is that when you divide an integer by n, you have n minus 1 possible remainders. That's all it's saying. It really is. 
So this is nothing more than the division algorithm, more or less. Um, so I'm not going to say a whole lot here. But um, in fact, I, I'm not even going to write all the all these uh, symbols out. Um, let me. I'll tell you what I will do though. Just to, <coughs> underneath these, I'm just going to label this zero. One and then all the, all the way down to n minus one. So I'm, I'm going to refer to these congruences here in a, in a minute. Say that um, A has a remainder of R upon division by n. Okay. Well, yes. Um, well, what do we know about R? Then, then um, 0 is less than or equal to uh, R. And I'm going to write this a little bit differently now. All right. I mean, normally what I write is 0 is less than or equal to R, which is less than N. But less than N is the same thing as less than or equal to N minus 1. R, R is an integer. Right? OK. Well, I'm going to, there's a subtle point here that the book kind of glosses over, which I want to mention. But um, just to make this concrete, I'll just say it this way. Um, if you divide 1 by 5, the number 1 by the number 5, what's the remainder? One, one. Sorry. Um, what if you divide two by five? What's the remainder? Two. two, right? Two, two is five times zero plus plus two, right? What if you divide three by five? What's the remainder? What's the remainder when you divide four by five? Four, four. No, it's 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 four, right? Okay. If you divide four by five. It's five times zero plus four, and four is. 0 is less than or equal to 4, which is less than 5. So that's the remainder. What's my point? My point is when you divide all of these integers here, 0, 1 to n minus 1, these are all less than n. So the quotient is 0. And each of these numbers, they're their own remainder. OK? That's what I'm trying to get at here. It's kind of a subtle point, but I, I want to make sure to, to, to mention this. So what can we say if a has a remainder of r upon division by n, and r is between 0 and n minus 1, r is less than n, then what's the remainder of r upon division by n? <coughs> r. So a and r have the same remainder upon division by n. They're both r. Therefore, by the previous theorem, a is congruent to r mod n. That was a, that's what the theorem says in your notes. If they have the same remainder, then they're congruent mod n. Upon division by n, they're congruent mod n. Since we're, we're just saying a has a remainder of r, r also has a remainder of r, because it's smaller than n. So therefore, a and r are both congruent mod n by theorem 1. OK? OK, so that means that, well, since r is between 0 and n minus 1, it's certainly one of these congruences. This congruence right here is certainly one of these above, right? Certainly is. OK, so one of those congruences help. Well, why can't you have more than one of these holding? Um, well, I mean, uh, OK, this is almost silly, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, in fact, I'm going to make this rest of this proof a little bit informal, just because I'm trying to get you to think about it a little bit. Why can't we have say um, a congruent to i mod n and A congruent to J mod N 
with i not equal to j. Why, why is this? Okay, so notice, remember, we're not quite done with this. Exactly one of those holds. I just showed you that one of them holds. I, we still need to show that two of them cannot hold, just one. Okay? Well, let me just say it first. Uh, this is almost so easy that it'll go over your head if you think too hard. It re really, I mean that. It's just really, there's nothing, not much to this. What did theorem 1 say? It said that if two integers are congruent mod n, they have the same remainder when you divide by n. They have the same remainder. What's the remainder? Now remember, i and j are among these numbers between 0 and n minus 1. What's the remainder when we divide j by n? J, because j is small, right? j is less than n, so the remainder is j. So therefore, a has a remainder of j when divided by n. But um, same thing has to be true here, right? What's the remainder of i when you divide by n? i. So therefore, because they're congruent, a has a remainder of i when divided by n. Well, can't have two different remainders. It only has one. So this is not possible. That's the gist of it. Because by theorem one, A would have a remainder of I and J upon division by n. And of course that's not possible. Okay. So here's kind of the point. We're going to see this. We may not get to this as much today, but we will on Thursday for sure. We'll finish the section. But the main idea here is that in some sense, when you look at this mod n relation, um, there are exactly n numbers that um, any that an integer can be congruent to, okay? And it's just the, the remainder when you divide by n. So for example, for example, I'm not going to write this down, but I'm just going to say this. Um, so if you give me any integer, I can tell you what that is mod 4, and mod 4 being either 0, 1, 2, or 3. Right? Okay, so for example, if you give me 27, okay, well, what is that modulo 4? It's either going to be 0, 1, 2, or 3. And the number it is, is it the remainder upon dividing 27 by 4, which is 3. Right? Divide 27 by 4, what's the remainder? Right? 6 times 4 plus 3. So it's 3, it's equal to 3 modulo 4. And everything modulo 4 is going to be either 0, 1, 2, or 3, exactly one of those. And those, the number is just simply the remainder upon division by 4. That's it. Okay, so basically what this does, in the past we'd use the division algorithm, for example, on your exam and on some of the homework problems, you said, okay, division algorithm, and, you know, we've got this, divide by 5, it's 5q plus 0, 1, 2, 3, you know, or 4, and then you had to multiply everything out and it got kind of messy. This is going to give us sort of a shorthand way of doing this without going through all the calculations. And you'll see how that applies here in a minute, but... This is the main idea, is that modulo n, there's essentially n different classes, and that's it. There's no more than that. Yes? Do you have the that ever use the uh, set sign for modulus? Uh, no. Uh, no. Yeah, it is. I've seen it, I've seen it done there, but um, yeah. the, uh, yeah, it's just an unfortunate, we don't like it. you know, yeah, no, yeah. Like, yeah. well, um, you know, I would, I know what it means, I, I would, yeah, I mean, I would, I would rather see the, you know, and we're talking about a difference of like 0 .01 seconds to change the, you know, to write the, these, between writing these things, so, what's that? Exactly, yeah, that's true, you can lose a lot of points in 0 .01 seconds, uh, no, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Um, so, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to you, but. What's that? Oh, okay. 
we were talking about like the mod three or three mod four. I was asking if we were going to do the negative one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That that'll come up too. Um, okay, so here's. Let me see. Yeah, um, this is the last theorem that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to prove some of these, but I'm not going to do all of them because I'm, I'm going to run out of time here. But um, we will definitely finish up. This is 4.2. Yeah, 4.1 is something about Gauss or, or <laughs> Gauss or Riemann or Euler, one of these uh, one of these prodigies that. that that yeah, they all died of pneumonia. Like, that. yeah, he was. Well, yeah, he went. He he was. He went blind like later in his life. I think he mathed himself. He mathed himself yeah. Some of his work was done while he was still. Oh, he did work after he was. Yeah, yeah that's true. Mm -hmm. I just think it's interesting. I just figured I'd mention it. No, you, yeah, that's true. Yeah, he he definitely did. I know you don't do history. Well, I know I know a few things about it. What's that? Euler. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> Pythagoras, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. He was, well, people were just jealous of him. Was, oh. Yeah, that happened, that, although, that does happen on occasion, but that happens less than you, than you might think, though. Um. Okay. <coughs> okay, so n bigger than one is is fixed. I uh, I didn't say this, but um, it's a it's an integer. Okay. N's an integer. A, B, C, and D are, are integers. There's no restriction on A, B, C, and D. They don't have to be positive. Okay. Then, and here's I think what I'm going to do is just um, prove these as we go. And some of them, I'm, like I said, I'm going to omit. I'm, I'm going to do some of the easier ones. Just make sure if you don't prove them, you do at least three times. Oh, uh, yeah, I will. I'll be able to right. I, I will definitely do that. Okay, so the first part, part A, is... Well, it's unfortunately we have an A here again, but is that A is congruent to A mod N. Okay, so this is a little bit more abstract now, but um, this, if you, if you really think about the definition, this is not hard. This is not hard. Remember what I said, what does this mean? It means you take the left-hand guy, subtract the right-hand guy, and ask yourself, does the number next to the mod divide it? Yes. Which is true, because a minus a is 0, and n times 0 is 0. So this is very simple, right? OK, so proof is it's almost kind of silly, but n times 0 equals 0, which is also equal to a minus a. So n divides. A minus A. <laughs> I, I might actually do. I might because I, I, I yeah. Well, it could be a. Uh, I would like to just put this one question alone on the test, and you either get a hundred percent or zero. Um, <laughs> put that right there on the test. That's fine. Uh, that's uh, I mean, what I just said is not going to actually happen, but uh, uh, it'd be easy grading for me though. That's true. That is for sure. Okay. Okay, so by definition, a is congruent to a mod m because n divides a minus a. Okay, the second part of this theorem if a is congruent to b mod n, let's see, I didn't look at this, maybe I should be careful. Um, but yes, then. B is congruent to A mod N. Okay, and this really gives, uh, I want to do this example because this, it's not very hard, but it, I'm going to kind of talk you through this. You know, for example, this was a homework problem, how you would think your way through the proof. 
This is an if-then statement. You can, there are lots of ways you can prove an if-then statement. Most of the ways we're going to use in this course are just direct proofs in which you assume what's called the hypothesis, the if part, and then you derive the consequent or the then part. So we're going to assume, and this is the way you start with an if-then proof. If you're going to do it directly, you assume the part that comes after the if and before the comma, right? Assume that A is congruent to B mod N. Um, I'll write this out in a little more detail. Don't forget what it is you're trying to prove. We must prove that B is congruent to A mod N. Okay. Now, here's the way that you want to go about this. Whenever you're trying to, to prove something, you should, if it's written in some sort of, you know, notation that's maybe not quite as, as um, clear or intuitive as what you're used to, break it down a little bit. And you can just do this in your head. What does it mean for B to be congruent to A mod N? It means we want to prove that N divides B minus A. Right? Left hand minus right hand. N divides B minus A. We have that A is congruent to B mod N. So let's write out what the definition, excuse me, what the definition is. A is congruent to B mod N means that N divides A minus B. Right? So from there, we want to be able to prove that N divides B minus A. And then we're done. So that's the idea. And that's basically what it's going to boil down to. Um, so n times x equals a minus b, right? For some integer x. I want to um, say this again, and some of you are losing a point or two on your homework for this. Um, when you introduce a new variable, you should always be saying where that thing exists in, what the universe is. Don't just say x, okay? Say x is an integer. Okay, so we've got this, and what we want to do is show that, in fact, n is a factor of b minus a. Okay, so n times something is b minus a. We've got that n times something is a minus b. So somehow from this, we should be able to manipulate this to get n times something is b minus a. So what you should be thinking about is, is there some algebraic you know, operation you could do to both sides that will get you what you want? Yeah? Can we just multiply both sides by negative 1 and then reabsorb that negative x into a y? Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Yes, very good. So all you have to do is... You, may, you should have seen this in calculus probably at some point with factoring, right? If you, or you can think about factoring out of minus 1 if you want to think of it that way. But if you, if you multiply both sides by minus 1, what's going to happen? The minus b will become plus b, and the a will become minus a. So then you're going to get b minus a, which is exactly what you want. Okay? Okay. So, Joe? Why do you have to have that nx equal that? Why can't you just work with that right side and do exactly what you just well, because we haven't, I know what you're saying, but um, you're saying the right side of the congruence. You have a, n is equal to a minus b. And n times x is equal to a minus b. That's yeah. why, you have to, why you need that step right there. Well, because we haven't proven really any properties of the congruence relation just yet. So, I mean, really right now we kind of have to just get back down to the definition because um, that's all we have to work with. I haven't really built up any machinery on what happens with congruences. So for example, if a is congruent to b mod n. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. I was thinking that it's n equal a minus b and it's not an n divides a minus b. Yes, b. yes. And that's why I messed up. Okay. So then what? So then you have nx is equal to a minus b? Mm hmm Okay. Yep. Okay, so if we multiply through by minus 1, we get n times minus x. I'm going to suppress the basic algebra here. I assume that you guys can, can do this. Multiplying through by minus 1 is just going to switch everything, right? So n times minus x is b minus a. Okay, as I was saying before. But that means that we just showed that n divides b minus a. So b is congruent to a mod n. 
Okay, not too bad. Okay, and we're gonna do a, a couple more of these. Yes. Um, in a lot of my previous proofs, I was taking an extra step to say if n times negative x is equal to b minus a, I would say negative x is equal to like x prime, so add x prime. Is that also dependent then? Uh, well, I mean. Yeah, I, I don't. I definitely don't expect you to do that. Uh, I mean, you're basically just using the fact that if x is an integer, then minus x is an integer. So, I mean, really, yeah, you, you're kind of doing more work than you have to. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, but um, this is totally fine. I mean, you you can you, you know you can assume that the negative of an integer is an integer, the product of integers is an integer, or the sum of integers is, is an integer. You know, these are things that we, that you can use without. Proof. And you're not really proving that anyways. All you're really doing is just saying, okay, minus x is an integer, I'm just going to call it something else. But there's really no reason to have to call it something else. So it's you can just... Exactly form right, n times an integer, yeah, right. Um, but no, you, you really don't need to do that. You're certainly not going to lose points for it, but it's, it's okay. Okay, so the next one is a little more complicated. If a is congruent to b mod n and b is congruent to c mod n. You may be able to guess what the conclusion is here. Then uh, a is congruent to c, right, mod n. Okay. I don't know if any of you have taken uh, some other math courses, maybe even discrete. So this this three bar relation here, this congruence relation, has these three three properties. Does anybody know what a relation with these three properties is called? Just out of curiosity. No. Good guess though. What's that? Well, that's what this property is. Yes. So anyway, it doesn't matter. You see that you may see this later. This is called an equivalence relation. Maybe some of you have heard that before. So reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, yeah. Um, okay, that's, but I was just curious. Okay, um, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to prove this, this part, okay? Um, it's actually really straightforward. I will say something about this. You can, in fact, if you just listen, you probably can see the proof right away. Anyways, what does this mean? This means that n divides a minus b. This means that n divides b minus c. So n's going to divide the sum, too. This is an old theorem from a long time ago. So a minus b plus b minus c is a minus c. n divides a minus c, and that's exactly, whoops, that. So that's it. You just add them together, and you're done. Yeah, I just did the proof. I just didn't write it down. So um, that's, that's how that one goes. OK. Um, everybody have this now? OK. OK, so. Um, Let's see, part D. If A is congruent to B mod N and C is congruent to D mod N, then um, a plus c is congruent to um, b plus d mod n. And um, a c is congruent to b d mod n. There are two more parts which I'm not going to prove. I'm going to write the proof of this. I'll give you the last two and then we'll stop. Okay. Right. 
So we're going to suppose that A is congruent to B mod N and C is congruent to D mod N. We need to get that A plus C is congruent to B plus D mod N. All right, so again, what are we going to do? We're going to translate these congruences into divisibility statements, right? Okay, well, I'm not, now I'm, I'm going to suppress going back to basic principles every time. There's a theorem, I think it's, you know, theorem 2 in section 2.2 .2 or something like that, that says that if, say, n divides x and y, then n also divides all linear combinations of x and y, right? So if n divides a minus b and n divides c minus, and so I'm, not, I'm just going to use that, just, I'm assuming you guys are, are with me on this now n divides a minus b and n divides c minus d, then of course it divides the sum, right? I mean, you can write this out directly. nx equals a minus b, ny equals c minus d, then n times the quantity x plus y equals a minus b plus c minus d, right? Okay, and I'm just going to rearrange the form slightly. That is, n divides a plus c minus the quantity b plus d. I want you to think about this for a second. Convince yourself that this is the same thing as what we have above. This quantity and this quantity are... <laughs> Are the same. I'll go ahead and put this in parentheses. I, of course, we, we really don't need the parentheses around the additive part here, but do you guys buy that? What is this? This is A plus C minus B minus D. A plus C minus B minus D. Same thing. Why did I write it this way? Because this is exactly what it means for A plus C to be congruent to B plus D mod N. It means the left-hand guy minus the right-hand guy is divisible by N. Okay? And this is just, we don't have to say more, it's just definition now. A plus C now is congruent to B plus D mod N. Okay. Um, now, for the last part, we're going to actually, I'm going to go back to basic principles. Um, we know that nx equals a minus b, and um, ny equals c minus d. For some integers x and y, right? <clears throat> okay, why am I writing this? Just from above, right? We have n divides a minus b, n divides c minus d. That's where this is coming from. Just the definition of divides. Okay, well, what do we have to prove? What's the last thing we have to prove? This is, and like I said, this is the last proof I'll do. I'll just give you the last two parts of the statements. We have to prove that n divides a c minus b d. So somehow I want to go from here. These are, these are my assumptions. I want to mess with this somehow so that I can get that n times something is AC minus BD. Okay. Well, here, let me, uh, let me do this again. I'm, I'm going to call this equation 1, and I'm going to call this second NY uh, equals C minus D equation 2. So first equation is NX equals A minus B. The second is NY equals C minus D. I want to show that AC is congruent to BD mod N. So... From nx equals a minus b and ny equals c minus d, I want to show that n divides ac minus bd. That's what I'm trying to prove. Okay, well, here's, here's, here's how you do it. I mean, you can't do this just by adding, right? Because you're not going to have an ac come out just by adding. So you're going to have to do some sort of multiplication here. So we want, we want again, remember, we want n to divide ac minus bd. So look at this first equation. Here's the idea. It's a little bit of a trick, but not much of a trick. We need to get an ac to come out somehow. So let's just multiply everything through here by C. 
So then we're going to have AC minus BC on the right side. So at least we have the AC part. But we don't want the BC, we want BD. So we need to get rid of the minus BC somehow. Well then if we multiply this through by B, we're going to, when we add, the BC is going to cancel and we'll be left with the minus BD, which is what we want. So what I'm doing is I'm multiplying the first equation by C, uh, and I'm multiplying the second equation by D, and then I'm going to add to, I'm going to add them together, and then N will divide AC minus BD. Okay, so once we do that, we get NXC equals AC minus BC. Multiply the second by D. Or, um, let's see. Sorry, I wanted to multiply it by B. Sorry about that. I want to multiply the second equation by B, yes. Otherwise you won't get BD. Yeah, I, I meant to write, write B. Okay. Um, so we get, uh, put two stars here, so we get NYB equals um, BC minus BD, right? Okay, so if we add these equations together, We get N times XC plus YB. That's the left hand side. After adding these two equations, the left hand side just factoring out the N here, right? And what happens when we add the right together, right? Well, this is just what I said before. The minus BC and the BC will cancel, and you'll, you just, uh, we'll just be left with AC minus BD, which is what we wanted. So now, because, because that, uh, that left hand side is an integer, you write the N. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that. Yep. So, yeah, that's right. So, what we know then is that, I mean, again, we know this is an integer, right? It's a product sum of integers. It's an integer. N divides AC minus BD. Therefore, by definition, AC is congruent to BD mod N. That's what we wanted to show. Yeah, you don't have to mention that. That's okay. Okay, um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a note to myself here, but uh, just for the sake of time now, we're, we're getting low on time. So um, this is not the end of Theorem 2. There are two more parts, but I'm just going to do those on Thursday. I'm going to finish up the rest of the section. I'm going to still, I'm going to give you your, your homework assignment. Um, you this, along with some of the examples in the book, you really should be able to get started on the homework. I'll tell you that this homework will be due next Tuesday. Okay, you got a week. Thursday we'll finish the section up and I'll give you some hints and you know such about how to start a couple of the homework problems. Okay, so I'll give you the homework and I'll give you your exams back here. Okay, so this is just to remind you again, this is section 4.2. Three, five, nine, twelve C, sixteen, and seventeen. Okay, so six problems. The other ones that don't have numbers, there's only one part to these. So you don't have none of these, like seventy doesn't have five parts. They're all just one one part. So it's not that bad. And then we'll we'll finish this up on, on Thursday, so you have the weekend to work on it. Okay. Did you have the due date? Uh, the due date for the assignment? One week from today. One week from today. Okay. All right. So let me get your uh, exams passed back. Um, you can, I'll tell you what, if you, if you want to leave when you get your exam, that's fine. Um, it's going to be a, a few minutes, so I will probably say a few things about the exam. 
if you want to stick around, okay? Um, I will tell you that the solutions to this test should be posted uh, in the next hour and a half or so online, all right? So again, what I encourage you to do, I really encourage you guys to do this. Look online, see where, where you made your mistakes, try to understand the solutions online. Then if you have any questions, just come and talk to me and I'll, I'll try to make things a little bit clearer, okay? Um, the only other thing I'll say before I pass these back is that um, some of you, I, I noticed that um, your scores went down quite, some of you, your scores went down quite a bit from the homework. So I know, you know, uh, some of you are working together. That's fine. I don't really care. I mean, if you want to work together in groups, that is fine with me. No, no big deal. Although I think some of you are using the internet as more, more of a resource than you should and are just sort of kind of copying down things uh, that you find online and then not really understanding what the solution is saying. And then when you get to the exam, you're having a lot of trouble. I think, I don't, I'm not saying I have any particular person in mind, but I, I just, from the scores, I think that that is happening for some of you. And um, it is hurting you on the exams. So uh, I really want to say, try not to do that. That is just not helping you, really. I mean, it's helping your homework score, but if your exam score is, is failing as a result of that, in the end, you're, you're not really helping yourself too much. You really should be trying to, to understand the problems. Come and talk to me. If you're having trouble, just come and talk to me. I, I will help you. A lot of you are doing this. And you know, I give you hints and stuff in, you know, in my office. That's really what you should be doing. Okay. Okay, David Harris. Okay. Uh, some of you are not here. You're scared. Michaela. Chris. Okay. Jessica is not here. I don't think. You, are you Jessica's, like, carrier pigeon? Yeah. Okay. She said if you'll give it to me. Yeah, no, she already told me, so uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Sarah? <laughs> I think calling you a pigeon is better than, is pigeon better than dodo? I don't know. I think they're dodo are dead. Okay. <laughs> that's true. Next okay. Brianna, Josh, Christina, Chad, Eric, okay, Joe. Douglas, Josiah, Annalise, Andrew, Andrew, not here, no. Leah, okay. Tori, not here. Okay, Nick. Carrie. Daniel. Diane. Okay, Michael. Okay, John, uh, Matt, and Talina. Okay, let me just say, let me say a couple things here. Those of you that are interested in sticking around. Um, okay, I'm not gonna write much here. The first problem, of course, was the same as the first problem on the uh, first test. Um, Okay, for the most part, two was, was pretty good, except M is the least common multiple. So that means it's the smallest one. Some of you flip the inequality around. So that means that any common multiple of A and B, M is less than positive, right? Common multiple of A and B, M is less than or equal to it, not bigger than or equal to it, okay? That's what we had with the GCD. The GCD is bigger than or equal to, right? Um, number two, most people got that one. Um, sorry, 2B. Uh, Okay, 3A, there was some, pro some trouble here. Some of you, 
and I know you know this, I, I know you all know this, but some of you in, sort of, you feel like the only integers are natural numbers, that the, that the negative numbers don't exist. A lot of you are forgetting about the negative numbers. So it's not, that's actually false, okay? Can you take, so I'll write this down, actually, let me just write this down real quick, okay? Um, okay, yeah, I keep doing this, okay. So, what, what is, um, what's 3A saying, really? The, the question really is, so A and B are non-zero integers. The question is, um, is it true that the least common multiple of A and B can never be greater than? What does it mean, mean to never be greater than? It means less than or equal to, right? To not be greater than means less than or equal to. Is the least common multiple of A and B always less than or equal to A times B? Well, you might say, well, a B is a, is a multiple of A, A B is a multiple of B, so the least common multiple should be less than or equal to that. Well, but there's a there's something you're missing here. We can take the least common multiple, we don't have to have the integers be positive. We can take the least common multiple of minus two and six, for example. Okay? So what if what if I take here, what if I take A to B one and B to B minus one? What's the least common multiple of one and minus one? See here's where some of you are forgetting the definition too. The least common multiple by definition is positive. Positive, right? So what's the least common multiple of one and minus one? I'm hearing some about a... It's definitely one, right? What's A times B in this case? Is one less than or equal to negative one? No, not true. I put this on there specifically because I, I have this feeling that a lot of you don't believe in negative numbers. And you should, okay? Okay, now, okay. Also, also 3B, there, there were some issues with this. Um, this, and, and here's something that a lot of you are gonna find as you go along in this course, that you are, and this is very common, this is what almost everybody does when they learn this stuff. You're writing way too much stuff, and that it's actually a lot easier than you might think. Okay, this problem, uh, and I'm not going to be precise now since I'm just kind of talking about this. The GCD of A and A plus P is either one or P. Well, this is just a special case of a problem you guys already turned in, and it was actually a solution that's online. I don't know if you guys will remember this. Some of you probably do. The GCD of A and A plus N is a factor of N. And then the last part of that problem was, therefore, the GCD of A and A plus 1 is 1. This is a homework problem that you guys did. It was graded. Solutions online. This is just a special case of that. So the GCD of A and A plus B should divide P? It's got to be 1 or P. I mean, of course, you have to write it right out the argument, but that's it. It's just a special case of the homework problem. Okay? So I'm not going to write all this out in detail. Okay? The detailed solution will be online. But if we let D be the GCD of A and A plus P, right? Then what do we know? Again, don't don't take this as the formal solution. It's not. I'm just trying to make this quick. We know that by definition of GCD, D divides A, and D divides A plus B, right? It's a common divisor. So if D divides A plus P and A, then D is also going to divide their difference, which is P. Since D is positive and P is prime, D is one or P. That's it. That's it. That's all there is to it. Okay, I, I have to say I don't feel like this was an unfair problem given the homework problem that you that you had. I, I don't think it is. Yeah. No, no, no. But but by definition, D is the GCD. So by definition, D is positive. That's why D has to be one or P. Yes, minus one divides one and P, but D is positive, so D has to be either one or P. Okay, but it comes from the fact that D is already positive by definition of being the G GCD. Okay, so also. Also, a lot of you guys, if, okay, if anyone want to walk out, that's okay. A lot of you guys are doing this, and this is also in some of the definitions too. You're saying that if P is a prime, it's only divisors are one and P. This is a subtle point, but that's not true. Five's prime, minus one is a divisor of five. Minus five is a divisor of five. If P's prime, the only positive divisors are one and P, okay? I hate to, to nick, nick you on this, but this is a, a class on proof, so we're, we need to be precise about this stuff. Okay, um, and then the other thing, the last thing I want to say, and most of this I, I'm just not going to, I'm running out of time here, but uh, um, 
the number seven, number seven, there, there was also some, some trouble with, with this. This is the last problem, right? P equals A squared minus B squared. And I, I give you a hint. I said to factor this, right? Okay, so it's A, a plus B times A minus B. Here's the part that a lot of you missed. And this is in the, you, so you have to read the problem. I, I, I put in parentheses, it's assumed that A and B are positive integers. A and B are positive integers. So if, okay, here's what I want you to think about. Okay, think about this for a second. If A and B are positive integers, th these are not trick questions. Is A plus B positive? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so if A plus B is positive, then A minus B also has to be positive, right? Because P is positive. So we know that they're both positive. Now, which of these two is bigger, A plus B or A minus B? A plus B is, is bigger. So if a prime is written like this and its only positive divisors are 1 and P, and this one is bigger than this one, then this has to be P and this has to be 1. Right? That, that's, it, that's it. And I, I could try to guide you a little bit on this, but it's not, it's, it's not that hard, really. I mean, you're just using the definition of prime. Well, that's that's it. It seemed too easy, so it can't be. Well, so what do you know from the second equation? A is equal to B plus 1, right? Plug that back in here. B plus 1 plus B equals P. And you can solve for B pretty easily now. B is equal to P minus 1 over 2. And once you know that, you know what A is. That's it. That's all there is to it. So, anyways. Um, uh, like I said, I'll have the solutions posted this afternoon. Um, I would encourage you to go through and look at these.